Welcome to the Wimbo Worldwide F1 Podcast. F1 content around the globe. Hello everybody and welcome to the Wimbo Worldwide F1 Podcast, episode 8. And today we're in Holland. Well, I'm always in Holland because that's where I live. And today I have with me a Dutch guest. It's Rob Veldman. I made a podcast with him before, after I think it was the Miami race. Not right. sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, that worked really well. So I asked him again. Uh, also because all the celebrities said no. Uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> we'll get there one day. <laughs> yep. Um, and uh, today, uh, the theme of the whole podcast is the Zandvoort uh, circuit, because next week uh, we'll be racing in Zandvoort. And we've prepared uh, five special uh, topics on the Zandvoort circuit. But uh, let's start with you uh, first, uh, Rob. How are you today? And um, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm getting ready for it. Uh, the sensation that Zandvoort is coming up and that it's going to be the first race after the summer break is uh, it's really exciting. So I spent the better part of this morning getting my camping gear uh, in order uh, because uh, I'll, of course, uh, go for the, the full experience with camping and cycling to the circuit through the dunes and then, uh, yeah, getting uh, getting to Zandvoort. Uh, I'll be there on Thursday when they open uh, the pit lane and then... Uh, Right through to uh, to Sunday, very nice. Four whole days on the on the track. Four whole days on the track uh, in 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 a sea of orange, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the second part of the season also. See, I was there in Austria, and uh, and the big uh, festival mood was already there. But I think in uh, Zandvoort, it's uh, it's even louder. I think. Yeah, it's it, it it's probably uh, Austria times uh, times two in terms of uh, uh, festival atmosphere on and around the track. The organizers do a lot for that, and, and I think in you know, Austria it's mostly the campsites that do a lot of the heavy lifting there. Yeah, uh, and it and it's really different. It's and I can understand why some of the more old school uh, F1 fans uh, seem to dislike it a little bit because it's. It's not a lot of talk about engineering and about car performance, and, and it's it's mostly a lot of loud noise. Yeah, it's it's an it's an excuse to uh, to party for some people. Yeah. yeah, and and that that's the ambience. It it added something to the calendar. Um, I think it, is the atmosphere better than Silverstone or Spa? I don't think so, but it's unique, and and that's why. Well, we'll get to that, but my tickets for 24 and 25 are in the bag also. So. I read that on, uh, on Twitter. <laughs> I don't want to miss out on Zandvoort. It's, it's got something unique. Yeah. It's just, you know, it, see, when uh, F1 goes to Japan and you have all these Japanese people uh, dressing up as drivers and putting cars on their head, <laughs> and, and, and everybody is like, oh, they're so enthusiastic, and, um, and they all think it's great. But then when they see uh, a partying mass of, um, of orange, uh, it's all of a sudden, uh, yeah, they're not real F1 fans, and uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's it, it's both unique, and you yeah. know, the, the F1 organization seems to like it enough. Yeah, for me, it's it's in Japan. For me, is always funny because you have this view of the Japanese as being quite timid, uh, uh, introverted people, and then they go all crazy around the Grand Prix. I don't think the Dutch around the world have the uh, 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 reputation of being very timid. No. <laughs> We're mostly, if there's a Dutch guy there, you'll notice them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and putting them all together, some 100,000 and a little bit uh, around the track is, uh, well, it's quite a feat. So yeah. uh, it's, quite, it's quite, a, quite an adventure. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, that's, that, that's a nice introduction to uh, what we're going to talk about. Because uh, the first topic we want to talk about is... Zandvoort, the circuit, the and cir I've prepared the following. Zandvoort. The Zandvoort track was built in 1948 when there was high demand for racing tracks. After the war, people were very enthusiastic about motorsport in general. The first Grand Prix was held in 1952 and won by Alberto Ascari. The original track layout was designed by the Dutch Automobile Racing Club and had parts of public road and a permanent track running through the dunes of this coastal town. 
Lamont winner Sammy Davis was hired as a consultant. In 2019, when the decision was made to renovate the track, the organization didn't choose Herm Herman Pilkey this time, but chose the Italian company Dromo Circuit Design. The designer's name is Jarno Zaffelli. It was most likely his idea to have this spectacular banking in the Tarzan corner. The track is called really quick and pretty insane by many drivers who love racing there. So, for since the return, the two races held there were good races and won by our own Max Verstappen. So, what did you think? Uh, a, a very, very nice introduction. Um, what did I miss? Uh, what did you miss? You didn't miss really anything, but there are some couple of, I think, fun stories that people should should or could want to know. Well, and that kind that's of why I hired you, so <laughs> hit me with I, it. Okay. Uh, first of all, you say 1948. Uh, uh, true, but the, the, the origin is 1939, just pre-war. During the war, a large uh, a straight line was constructed that is now no longer part of the circuit, but is part of the access road to the circuit, which is um, called the Van Lennepweg. And that probably will ring a bell. Uh, pretty long straight line, which was sold to the Germans as being necessary to construct, because after the war, that would give a place to parade for the Germans. But of course, it was more like, how can we keep on building the track during the during the wartime. So during the, the, the war years, actually, construction continued. Okay. Uh, after the war, in 1947, construction had to be halted because uh, the bricks that were being used to lay down the surfacing, uh, there were some bricks that were used to construct houses, and it was uh, actually, they had to stop the construction because all bricks had to be used to reconstruct houses. And now something funny, the bricks didn't end up to construct houses because the Prince of the Netherlands, Prince Bernard van Oranje, actually bought these bricks for 20,000 euros so that it could be used to lay down the track. That was the first time the Dutch royal family actually intervened in the construction of Zandvoort circuit. And uh, we'll get to that, but the reason that we have a current Grand Prix is again because there's a Prince Bernard, but now Junior. Who, uh, who intervened to get that uh, that dream going again? Yeah, I think that's quite interesting that, that in that history it, it resonates a little bit. Okay, okay we're back. <laughs> um, uh, Rob needed uh, to put on uh, headphones and um, to have a microphone uh, to have better sound. So. Right. So okay. everything that hides the head a little bit, huh? Yep. Probably works. <laughs> Perfect. Now, so some fun facts about the history, uh, especially uh, the, the early history of the Zandvoort circuit. Um, and uh, of course, I, I had to look this up also. Uh, 1948 was the first Grand Prix, but it didn't account for the F1 championship. Uh, but it was won by a Prince Bira in the Maserati. Okay. Uh, <laughs> which now, Prince Bira in, in the Netherlands among podcasters, I think you probably know that name. It's, uh, it's, it's used also in podcasting uh, by somebody. Okay. No, I don't. I always thought it had something to do with beer, but no, it was the f very first uh, victor of the, of the Zandvoort Grand Prix. Is, is that a Dutch podcaster? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. I need to look him up. Or, or maybe I'm just consuming way too much Formula One content. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote it down. Yes. Anyway, very good. Uh, yeah, so uh, as of 1952, uh, part of the of the championship of Formula One. Yeah, and uh, that started the illustrious history of uh, of Zandvoort as a as a circuit. Yeah, it it was on the calendar for a long, long time. Uh, was it all the way through eight, uh, 1985? On and off, there have been a couple of years uh, in which um, uh, they were prevented from having it, already having to do with getting the license to. Uh, um, with the noise that, the, of course, the cars produce. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it has been off a couple of years. But I think uh, when uh, Max in 21 won, he won the 33rd edition of the Dutch Grand Prix. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Again, and for people who, be who believe in numerology, uh, yeah, some of yeah, those omens. <laughs> That's his racing number, obviously. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. No, uh, that's very interesting. Um, anything else on the subject of the circuit? 
Well, of course, the layout changed a lot over the years. Um, those early years were, were quite long laps uh, where they raced over a long straight van, van Lennepweg. They took the panorama corner um, and, and Zandvoort um, almost disappeared when uh, the circuit went bankrupt somewhere in, I believe it was the early 80s, and then sold off a part of the land and had to make a really compact and tight circuit. And uh, yeah, that's what uh, what shaped the the circuit as we know it uh, today. Yeah, yeah. Drivers seem to love it, the way it's. Uh, it is. Uh, and... Yeah, it's, I can imagine it's quite challenging. They they love the bankings. If I heard it, the the modern day drivers, uh, with some comments about whether or not the banking is equal enough to really take several lines across, especially the Hugenholz corner. But I can imagine they uh, they really like that. For overtaking, it mustn't be the the easiest track with these wide and large cars. No. But it's uh, I can imagine you have some sweaty palms uh, racing at a full speed across. It. Those big cars it has been a complaint uh, that I hear all the time from the drivers. Uh, yeah. As for proper racing. And, and it plays a part uh, when we get to the future of Zandvoort, which is uh, not negligible, but but I'll save that as a cliffhanger. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Um, so you talked about um, the Ari Luyendijk corner, of course, which used to be known as Bos Uit when the track was still longer. It's really, you were driving out of the forest. Yeah. Uh, uh, no forest near Zandvoort now, and, it, uh, and it's the Luyendijk uh, corner. Uh, in which uh, the Italian uh, um, designer indeed developed the banking. Uh, and the banking for F1 fans who know how well F1 likes racing on banked circuits um, uh, made a lot of people nervous because it gave them flashbacks to the US Grand Prix where only six cars actually made the start because the Michelin tires that a lot of the grid was driving on were blowing up under the pressure of driving on a bank. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> it, was, it was good for uh, Robert Dortbos because he he, he finished fourth. Out uh, of Christian, five. Christian Albers. Oh, it was Albers. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that was Albers. Dortbos was already out of the yeah. running back. Yeah. I knew there was a Dutchman uh, involved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, but uh, yeah, that, that was uh, so that, that made a lot of people nervous. But of course, uh, yeah, Lion Dijk corner. I well, was... Some people took uh, three pit stops uh, the last race. Um, it, it's either two or three pit stops, uh, isn't it? Because it's pretty yeah. hard on the tires. The, the circuit is quite abrasive. It's been hot the, the last two editions, which is uh, not looking like it's going to be hot this uh, this weekend. Some 20 degrees only and even a chance of rain. Um, and there's also this big risk of safety cars. Uh, so uh, last year, of course, we had the extra stops due to safety cars that, yeah. uh, that probably people wouldn't have made because they were on the hards and the mediums after the, the, the first stop. Um, so yeah, curious to see how that uh, how that plays out. It can be quite chaotic in the pit lane. Yeah, small pit lane, and then uh, of course taking the pit lane, you avoid the first Tarzan corner, and you actually get out uh, right after that. That's also a little bit of a strategic element of where do you uh, come out exactly uh, on, in terms of track position, um, and and immediately then into the the, the tight combination into the Hugo's corner. So it's a, it's a dynamic track. Yeah, dynamic, definitely. Okay, so do you want to start uh, with uh, part two, the Dutch glory? Yeah, Dutch glory, of course, because maybe part of understanding why uh, the Dutch are so crazy right now about uh, Max Verstappen, of course, and, 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 and all the success we've been seeing in the recent years in F1, is also understanding how long we've had to wait for some degree of success in F1. Uh, very first Formula One driver, I think, was Karel Godin de Beaufort, actually an, an Esquire, um, young here. Um, Kareltje, uh, little uh, little Charles, let's say, yeah, because he was Charles. almost oh, he was almost two meters long and uh, weighed about 120 kilos. Uh, <laughs> only uh, the car for him to possible to partake in was a, a rather large Porsche. Um, and Karel uh, actually was uh, was one of the first Dutch, uh, yeah, uh, professional and successful drivers. And, and when I say successful, that's moderate because he didn't take a lot of points uh, in Formula One, but he did take his first points actually at the Dutch Grand Prix. Okay. And um, that was in 1962, where he finished sixth out of only nine cars to actually finish the race. 
So um, that also is an indication 20 cars started, only nine finished, and Carol managed to get there in uh, in sixth place. But was it raining or? Uh, no, it's uh, if you look up the, what the reason for the failures are, many are mechanical and technical. Uh, some cars didn't even make it to the grid. Uh, so that was really a, an era of Formula One where uh, yeah, uh, cars breaking down was more common than uh, than not. Yeah. Um, Actually, it was also the race in which another Dutch uh, um, driver, Ben Pon, which uh, who now has, of course, uh, a part of the grandstand named after him, the Ben Pon Tribune on the straight. Ben Pon participated as well and crashed out of that race uh, in uh, in '62. On the Schijflak, he had a quite rough uh, uh, crash, fell out of his uh, Porsche, and uh, actually uh, miraculously escaped with only a few scapes and not even a broken bone. So quite lucky there well that, that's what they used to think if you get flung out of the car that's better than uh, staying in the car nobody wanted to to have actually uh, a seat belt at that time because a seat belt was pretty much a guarantee that you would stay attached to a flaming bomb yeah uh, but we'll get so. to that um, in part three of the <laughs> podcast <laughs> L- loads of cliffhangers so carol but go down that, that was the very first one and still I think the fifth most successful Formula One driver out of the Netherlands, and probably nobody has heard of him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the fourth one is then uh, uh, easiest, Gijs van Lennep. Uh, as you may have heard, the van Lennep weg probably has to do something with the fact that Gijs also is an esquire uh, and his family uh, uh, quite well known around the area of Zandvoort, Haarlem, Aardenhout. Uh, and Gijs uh, is, is uh, a very enthusiastic, still uh, 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 racing uh, driver who uh, managed to win Le Mans actually with Helmut Marko together. Uh, that's where he uh, may have gotten some fame from, not too much from his Formula One days. Um, he actually made his debut, I think, in Formula One in 72, something like that. Um, yeah, so uh, that, that, that's uh, uh, also Dutch glory. Also his first points that he scored within the Dutch Grand Prix. So there's some home ground advantage there. And uh I think that was in 73 that he marked his, uh, his first points after a 72 debut. So, Gijs van Lennep, we saw him in the very first edition. I thought for me, quite an emotional moment, driving, seeing him driving around in his Porsche among a lot of the other classic cars uh, at 80 years, still going strong. And he's uh, still there also for the historic Grand Prix at Zandvoort, which is a wonderful weekend to visit also. Yeah, we still see him on the, um, the TV shows. Uh... You know, the, yeah, still going strong. The race cafe and everything. Yeah, just like one of the guys who's really a legend of the track in terms of Jackie Stewart, who was there very prominently for the first edition as well. Uh, that generation and those who survived, those who managed to not get killed in the, in, in those yeah. years. So it's just quite nice to see them. Um, so yeah, that's that's actually uh, in terms of Dutch success, then, then you're pretty much uh, have had it all because Jan Lammers, while he raced there, was never really successful because he didn't get into any competitive cars. He always was forced to race in, in, in pretty poor cars that sometimes didn't even make it to the grid. I, I um, emailed him to do this podcast. Yeah, but he Jan, said, I can imagine. He said he was busy. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Jan is of I also asked him if he knew anybody else, you know, who worked at the track. He says, I'm sorry, Wim, I don't even have time to sort it out for <laughs> you, but good luck with your podcast. I'll send him the link after. Yeah, great. No, Jan is very enthusiastic and, and normally very open and approachable person. But oh, do you can... know him personally? or? Um, I've, I've met him a couple of times around the track, but I, he wouldn't know me. I, no. of course, know him. Uh, I talked very briefly during the Dutch, uh, the historic Grand Prix at Zandvoort. Um, yeah, but, but very approachable normally, yeah. but these weeks are crazy. Yeah. Uh, especially uh, yeah, around the track with all the different stakeholders that he has to manage to uh, <laughs> to keep everything going. Yeah. And that, uh, this, the, the municipality, huh, who is one part cooperating, one part trying to get more tax income and, and regulate uh, the, the track. It's uh, stakeholders uh, like like action groups who want to, well, be vocal around the Dutch Grand Prix. Taxi drivers on strike. Taxi drivers who want to go on strike. I mean, and, and I'm not saying he handles everything personally, but I'm, I'm guessing he's, uh, he's very much involved with uh, yeah, how to keep everything running smoothly. Yeah. Um, 
But as a driver, of course, great driver, drove everything, I think, that has a steering wheel and, 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 and four wheels on it, um, uh, but wasn't very successful in F1 uh, and, and didn't really uh, make a large impression during the Dutch Grand Prix. And then, of course, we have uh, th this entire uh, gap because we have, uh, since 1985, when the last Grand Prix was, was run in, on Zandvoort, up until uh, 2021, uh, nobody who could really show their talent and excel at uh, uh, at Zandvoort. Yeah. Just in, in A1 Grand Prix, which, which ran for a couple of years, if any F1 fans remember that. Yeah. But, uh, so that, that's pretty much it for Dutch glory at the, at the Dutch Grand Prix. Some some points, but not very much success. No. No, well, they, yeah, I mean, becoming successful in something, that, that takes time. And, uh, and, and perhaps um, uh, the Dutch uh, are not as big a petrol heads as the British, for instance, uh, were no, at the that's time. Just, that, that's for sure. We, we've had uh, some fairly successful... Drivers, you see very often it's it's uh, it has to run in the family. Uh, you can see that now with the young generation of uh, well, also Jan Lammers, eh, his son, yeah, uh, is is doing very well. Uh, René, um, uh, he just won a karting championship. You see the Cornell Rocco, Rocco is doing Cornell, very, yeah. is doing very well. Uh, I don't know if either Jan or uh, uh, Tom are really uh, as involved as Jos was with the career of uh, of Max, but you see that it, the talent has to run in the family, and there needs to be this kind of yeah, dynasty probably for for the talent to uh, yeah. to really come. To but the that surface. makes sense as well. You know, uh, our, our local butcher is the son of uh, of the butcher before, and and he got it from his father. So you know, in, yeah. a, in a sense, that's uh, pretty normal. If you look at the history of the sport, it's first it was Esquires, huh? the, the 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 rich people who got yeah. maybe a little bit bored, weren't too afraid of dying after the World War and uh, got into racing uh, to have some uh, some some fun. You then got a, a large stream of people who were just into racing and grew from a mechanical side, maybe from uh, a more entrepreneurial side, uh, into the sport. Uh, and yeah, but you need to have racing families with a little bit of pedigree and dynasty to get into a, a cart at age four, five, six, and, uh, uh, I, and I excel. Think th I think that's going to change, though. Um, you know, with uh, sim racing becoming so popular, um, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, the best way to, to take a corner and everything is, is you know, kids learn yeah. that yeah. Uh, way I, earlier. I, and, and what I've heard from uh, Max, Max Verstappen, is that he's going to have a GP3... Um, um, it, it was a GT team. first. GT team, yeah, GT yeah. three, yeah, uh, comprised of sim racers, and I can I can imagine that that he wants to explore whether or not the the the, the trajectory via sim racing into a GT car, and then into, yeah, he also said eh? that karting was really racing. expensive, so it has become extremely expensive, of course, to do it at the level that they were doing it. Uh, a lot of travel. Um, yeah, everybody, uh, the, the level of professionalism has, has, has risen so much that I think, yeah, you, you spend a lot of uh, money before you even get close to a podium. But I'm, I'm wondering, you know, we always say sim racing, you can learn a lot in terms of setup, in terms of technique, in terms of indeed how you take the corners. Uh, but what you don't quite have is that physical sense of oh no the the, the g oh forces <laughs> the g yeah. forces and the danger that that's definitely not there. I think and that was something that uh, Christian Horner said was his reason to get out of uh, uh, car racing and into uh, becoming a team principal. He said, well, I was seeing guys do things that my physical instincts were saying, if you try this, you're going to get yourself killed. I mean. I just wasn't that reckless, and I think that's interesting if to see if people can actually make that career switch. Yeah, um, but we'll see. I mean, some some guys are really uh, doing really well both in sim racing and in car racing. Yeah, well, uh, uh, the the flame for something needs to be ignited, and um, obviously, if if uh, you don't have the thousands of euros that uh, driving a car uh, costs, if you don't have that, but you have um, uh, a computer yeah. console and you, and you get addicted to, sure. uh, to to driving sure. and, you, and you want to take it a step further and further and further then um, yeah. I, I don't see why why that couldn't lead to a professional career in motorsport yeah 
to get it back to the topic of, of the Zandvoort Grand Prix, I think for that it's also very important that we have that Grand Prix in the Netherlands. Because how do you get enthusiastic uh, by seeing those cars go around that track, by, by smelling them, by feeling them? Um, I took my eldest daughter to the uh, historic Grand Prix weekend. You go into the pit boxes, you have engineers there who worked with the original drivers and the original cars explaining to you and, and telling you what they're doing to prepare those cars to get out on track. And that, I mean, if you become uh, addicted to that, uh, you'll find a way to to make any kind of career. Maybe you don't have the talent to drive, but you're more of an engineer or more of a marketing guy. You'll find a way to to get into uh, your passion. Yeah, and I think for that it's really important that we have this Grand Prix in the Netherlands so that Dutch people get that that kick and and see. You know, we don't have to be the also rands in uh, in the entire uh, uh, motorsport field. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, yeah. I think this is a great time to uh, start on the next topic. Yeah, uh, the tragedies. So we've had a few. I uh, went on the internet and I uh, found three, well, some of them I already knew, uh, three big incidents, and I just want to read them out mm. to you. Uh, the tragedies. Dan Gurney in 1960. This accident was caused by the brakes of American driver Dan Gurney not working. He crashed over a barbed wire fence, killing an 18-year-old young man who was in a prohibited area. I saw in a video on YouTube that he was really angry with his team BR BRM for giving him a faulty car. Now, I can't remember which content creator it was or what the video was about. Um, so, yeah, he got away with a, a, a broken arm. So yeah. it was a tragedy that that young bystander uh, died. Then in 1970, Pierce Courage. The... Tommaso car he was driving had a chassis made of magnesium, which burns like mad. He crashed into the dunes and died when the wreck burned ferociously. He was only 28 years old and he drove for Frank Williams when it happened. So yeah, that was one of those things where um, they, yeah. they, they kept trying to make the cars lighter and uh, they chose um, a metal that burns like, like nothing you've ever seen. Yeah. And then the third one is Roger Williamson in 1973. Roger Williamson's story is the most sad and the images are pretty graphic. He was 25 years old and only on his second race when he presumably had a tire fa failure that flipped him upside down. The safety measures were incredibly poor those days and the help he received at first was from a helpless David Purley who was seen in the famous footage, trying to flip the car back and emptying a fire extinguisher, extinguisher in the flames. The race continued because the race wasn't stopped. Drivers and the organization thought he was okay and out of the car because they saw a driver walking around the wreck. So Roger Williamson was burned alive in the wreck because the fire truck took forever to get to the place where the accident happened and they didn't want to drive against the incoming traffic. A few, a few things changed after this horrible accident, but still a lot of drivers died in those days. So what's your, re uh, your reaction to those three stories? Yeah, uh, of course, incredibly tragic, and, 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 but also characteristics for those days. Like, uh, as we said earlier, you uh, have an accident, you get uh, uh, flipped upside down and, and you're caught in the fire. Um, you were considered lucky if you flew out of the car and into the sand dunes and uh, and, and could escape the the, the, the accident. Uh, the, in this case, that was not possible. Also, the, the last one, of course, Roger Williamson. Some of the um, uh, fire extinguishers weren't even uh, full. Yeah. Um, the uh, people who had to put out the fire didn't have protective gear, so they couldn't get close to that fire, which was running extremely hot. Um, yeah, if you if you look at that, you you cannot imagine that those were the conditions uh, it, under it, which they uh, they raced. It's it's like a, a human life uh, just uh, wasn't that important yeah. those days or something. Yeah, I, I I kind of if you look put it in a historic context, which a lot of documentaries also do. It, it's post World War Two. We've seen a lot of death and destruction. 
uh, young men weren't living to the age of 80, or at least not guaranteed to live to that age. Uh, uh, they were taking that risk and, and saying, well, I'd rather have lived and, and, and risk it all than, uh, than, uh, uh, than not participate. And I think that's the kind of mentality that t today, well, I think fortunately we don't have. We value uh, no, uh, today you get... an athlete's life a lot more than, uh, than we did. T today, uh, McDonald's gets sued for uh, serving too hot coffee yeah. and, and not having a, war a warning on the cup. Yeah, that's that's the other extreme, and then that's and that's why in Formula One, yeah, you had this debate, of course, when the when the um, halo was introduced, uh, where a lot of people said it's open wheel racing and we don't need to have a, a roof over our head. But a lot of these guys that you just mentioned died because the car flipped on the, on, on its head, yeah. uh, and they were either directly knocked out and couldn't get out of the car, or uh, well, <laughs> they were trapped at least. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and and weren't protected there. And there was no protection between them and, and the gas tank. But, you know, like the, the people that invented these cars, that developed these cars, they were clever people. Yeah. So they, they knew about magnesium. They knew they were sitting on a bunch, a, a, a big tank of fuel, very, very yeah. flammable stuff. And then you make the, 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 the chassis out of uh, a metal that's... Uh, that yeah, but with you... You, what you also have to remember is that the drivers at these times, they were not in contract with teams as fixed as they were now. And they were fighting to get into the fastest cars, huh? even though yeah. they're very, very risky. I mean, uh, Chapman was, was known for having cars that were not the safest. But yeah, they were fast and he always had the latest innovation. So I want to drive for him. Um, That's Colin Chapman. Yeah, Colin yeah. Chapman. Um, I think in the list of tragedies, you, you missed someone uh, after whom we actually named a corner in Zandvoort, which is Gerlach. Oh. Uh, the, Ger the Gerlach uh, corner is uh, named after Wim Gerlach, who died uh, in that corner in 1957. Uh, also in Formula One? Uh, no. Oh. I think that, that, that wasn't in, in Formula One, I think. No. Uh, unless I'm mistaken. That's but I know why I missed it. I know that's why it's, it's named after him for that reason. Yeah. Um, and we have another uh, corner that is named after uh, somebody who drove there and actually died as a consequence of an accident there, which is Rob Slotemaker, uh, which was not in F1, uh, no. but he went sideways into a medical vehicle and the sideways impact uh, uh, actually broke his neck and led to him dying some, somewhat later. So those are two corners in Zandvoort that are named after uh, tragedies, but also after people who, uh, yeah, who are famous in Dutch motorsports. Yeah, uh, the, there was a Frenchman that went straight ahead into the crowd. It was uh, yeah. René Arnoux. Yeah. But for, for, nobody got killed in that uh, accident, which is a pretty much a miracle on its own. Um, yeah, and, and that is if you look at the, how, the, how the Zandvoort circuit is made, then you see the Tarzan corner with quite a large runoff possibility, of course, and the Schijflak fast corner, but also with reasonable runoff. You, you would estimate that the biggest risk would be to a spectator standing in those dunes and getting a car launched right at them, um, which I guess was also part of the attraction for a lot of the spect yeah. spectators. Yeah, it, if, I, if I see those images, I think of how people watch rally racing uh, standing yes. alongside the track. And, and yeah, you, you must have felt the thrill of uh, not knowing whether those cars were actually going past or um, flying towards you. Yeah. It's so, uh, yeah, a, lo a lot of uh, unfortunate tragedies there. The last one, by the way, not that long ago, uh, 2017, uh, David Ferrer in the historic uh, Grand Prix, who actually went uh, straight on with his march in the Lion Dyke corner and had a heavy crash and died. But it's yeah. something people may, may not know. <laughs> yeah, I've read that as well. But I wanted to leave something for you as well. Yeah, um, I think... <laughs> In but terms that, of presence, we've that's had especially a... tragic, you know, to have a, a sort of a, a race to remember all these these beautiful old cars, and then um, you know that the, there's no competition. <clears throat> a bit uh, like yeah. a, a bit like how um, uh, Charles Leclerc uh, almost wrecked that old Ferrari in uh, Monaco. Um, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the speeds season. were the speeds were not the same, but no. I, I was amazed when I saw the guys running the historic Grand Prix cars that they, they yeah they've got some fire in them and they uh, they want to show everybody what the beasts can do and and yeah that unfortunately yeah, in, Austria, uh, they, in Austria they went pretty fast as well those uh, those eight legendary cars yeah 
So, um, yeah, always risky. And uh, we can never completely take the risk out of uh, Formula One. But I'm glad we got Zandvoort up to current F1 standards. And, uh, and, and I think that the risk of something like that happening, I mean, God forbid this weekend, but uh, I think the, the risk is, is, is manageable. Yeah, no, the, the, the last the really scary accident we've seen was uh, Silverstone um, last season with uh, Joe. Yeah, when you Joe was, was... And, You know, that, that fence was really strong because it, uh, it landed in the fence. A strange fluke accident. There was no, yeah. I, I, I haven't seen any word, by the way, about the analysis on that, on that uh, crash and, and what they think they can improve. But it was such a weird... Uh, accident well the i think they uh, they enhanced the roll bars on cars after that didn't they okay yeah they reinforced the roll bars maybe adding a little bit more to the weight because, still of the car yeah. because um yeah th that didn't give the protection it, that, that was the halo again that protect protected him yeah definitely but uh yeah it's insane uh like I, i've seen a documentary uh about uh ferrari i don't know like i've seen a couple but one of them um, Enzo Ferrari was told that uh, that his driver um, had an accident and uh, and it killed a, uh, some children and um, yeah uh, and the next thing he did was uh, hire a new driver and uh, and just continued. You know the people yeah. were so harsh these days. Uh, yeah, definitely. Like one of the comments of um, the, what, what was said in the, this uh, documentary was that. Uh, in the 50s, uh, people were sort of uh, disappointed if the driver uh, got out of the car alive because, uh, because of the, the spectacle uh, value of, yeah. uh, of a death in motorsport. Yeah, maybe it translates back to how we watched gladiators uh, yeah. in, in, in the ancient days. But yeah, for me, I, it's, it's so far from... How I react when I see a crash. I mean, I remember very vividly I was sitting in front of the screen when uh, that Grosjean crash happened. And um, everybody who knows me knows I'm a fervent atheist, but these are the moments that you might start praying. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really, uh, yeah, you hope that people get out, uh, get out alive of that. Yes, and that, but then as soon as we know we were, we were, he was okay, um, I think um, Drive to Survive uh, made a whole special out of it. And I think uh, Roman was, in, was Roman did talk. pretty well to milk that cow. Also, <laughs> he told his story a million times. So uh, yeah, he, he was in that record for about twelve minutes. <laughs> yeah, and it's, if I look at IndyCar, then he didn't change his driving style altogether that much. No, it, it was actually <laughs> not a surprise that he had that sort of crashes. Uh, looking yeah. at his history, Spa, and when we still didn't, uh, when we didn't have the halo, I mean, he uh, he crashed over three or four different cars. Yes. When he, uh, but I yeah. remember another incident, and it must have been after 2015, where he went off track and he spun. And then what drivers do is they sort of keep the spin going and then try to get on track again. And he just flew across the track. It was with all that smoke. Do, yeah. do you remember which race that was? I, 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 uh, I don't remember the exact race, but I remember the, the imagery. And I thought, how can you... Yeah, how can you regain the track like well, that? Well, people I mean, are watching this on a, on a, a premiere. It might help us, yeah. <laughs> I'll see it in the comments. Yeah, please, please do. Yeah. Because it was very counterintuitive to, uh, let's say it was rather very selfish to try and get back to the track in that way. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's it for drama, I think. Yeah. I hope we don't see uh, much more drama in the uh, in the upcoming years. It's, uh, it's it's become quite a safe track, especially as a visitor. Grandstands all around, so you're higher up. You're not in the dunes. Yeah. Except well, for some general admission zones. But that, that didn't help the people in Le Mans in uh, what was it? Uh, no, correct. 1950. Yeah. Yeah. Car, yeah. These cars are are less prone to flying, I think. Yeah. And, and bits flying off it. So do we get to the legends part already? Yes. Um, legendary winners and I've prepared this this is not such a long topic the legendary winners of the Zandvoort GP Jim Clark won the race four times and he's pretty legendary one of the goats to some of the people that follow F1 uh, Jackie Stewart we named him earlier he's a three time winner and he's still around I love that crazy little Scotsman 
And Nicky Lauda, <laughs> he's won it three times too. Also a legend. We lost him not too long ago. Mm-hmm. Then there's a bunch of two-time winners. Um, Ascari, Brabham, James Hunt, Alain Prost, and our own Max Verstappen. And I have a funny feeling it might be he might be a three-time winner after the race on Sunday. Some really awesome names there. I have to admit that I don't know all of their careers that well. But as I'm making more content, I learn more and more about the olden days, and I love that. Yeah, so, that's good. I, I, what I think, if you if you look at the list of winners of the Zandvoort Grand Prix, there are only drivers there that you know by name, that you know being legends. It was a real driver circuit. Yeah, yeah they, they all have, uh, as to quote one of the winners, big balls. Big balls. You need big um, balls. Uh, and definitely. Um, I think it's Jim Clark, of course, testament to his talent, and he always felt right at home uh, when he came to uh, to Zandvoort, and it showed. Also, sometimes by the margins by which they uh, they won. Um, Nicky Lauda, I, the last uh, Dutch Grand Prix, I actually uh, remember when uh, you have Nicky Lauda and Alain Prost uh, crossing the line, only point two or point three of a second behind each other because Lauda really had to fence off uh, Prost, uh, both in the McLaren. So it was a brilliant, a brilliant finish. But what we sometimes tend to forget is that the next car was some 40 seconds behind. Uh, <laughs> um, I think in that time it was, wasn't that Senna? It was in the third place in, in 85. I'm not quite sure, but people will correct me if I'm wrong. But it, at least th- th- there were two cars 40 seconds behind and the rest of the field was more than a lap behind. So you always see these uh, big differences in, uh, in in the prior winners of the Zandvoort Grand Prix where some re- do really well on that track uh, but there's also uh, quite a large gap to the to the back markers uh, and it's a track that historically not a lot of cars actually finished on so we see a lot of DNFs uh, throughout history on uh, on the track so the guys uh, who did make it had uh, uh, incredible cars incredible car control big balls and, uh, and to win it uh, three or four times, uh, yeah, it's very, very strong. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, I, I also hope and think that uh, Max might get to the three times winners category. Uh, but previous editions, qualifying was extremely close. I remember 21, uh, the, the qualifying was, uh, of course, against Lewis Hamilton and uh, Valtteri Bottas. And I think the difference with Hamilton was 400th in the qualifying. And during the race, it was still kind of tight in the sense that uh, Max still had to overtake Bottas, uh, who was on a different pit stop strategy with uh, a Hamilton uh, fast charging behind. He made quick work of that, but it was closer than maybe people remember. Yeah. And uh, and last year, the qualifying uh, with Leclerc was extremely uh, close also. Uh, and during the race... I mean, that could have gone all different ways. And with Yuki's, uh, uh, my car is working, my car is not working, my seatbelt's on, my seatbelt's not on. And, and then uh, Bottas uh, uh, grinding to a halt on the straight. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that could have ended up differently. So uh, no guarantees there. But uh, yeah, it's, it would be great if he can make it three times. It's also, so because of that gap, also one of the few tracks that Hamilton hasn't won it. So yeah. he'll be quite eager to get that uh, first win since Saudi Arabia 21 yeah. uh, at the Dutch Grand Prix. I think he'll be uh, more than a little bit motivated. Oh, yeah, th- th- that would be uh, uh, sort of a little bit of karma as well uh, for uh, everything that happened <laughs> between um, uh, Max and, uh, and Hamilton. Between then and now, yeah. Because, yeah. you know, I just made a karma video. I don't know okay, if you've yeah. seen it. I saw it, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, did that, you get a lot of uh, comments about uh, the, the the top one and two uh, car months? N- no, no, the, the, there weren't okay. uh, too many. It, uh, it got about thirteen uh, dislikes, which is uh, okay. which is a lot more than um, yeah. Than People normal. are slowly starting to process it. I saw uh, Abu Dhabi in the whole twenty one season. I saw that Crofty in his mid mid uh, season review said that uh, Abu Dhabi twenty one was actually the the race that he most enjoyed or is the most proud of commenting on. And 
that kind of opened some old wounds, but also, yeah, got some people in terms of processing that it actually was a, a great ending to a great season. Yeah. But uh, it would be uh, the ultimate uh, karma comeback if uh, if Hamilton were to take it uh, this weekend. Yeah. On the other hand, I think... Uh, the I, papaya... I, could, I could totally live with it, though. Yeah, me too. Me too, definitely. Um, I, I do hope Verstappen can go for that most wins in a sequence. Uh, he's going for to equal Vettel's nine-streak yeah. record. Um, but... I think maybe in the remaining 10 races, if he doesn't win Zandvoort, he still has nine races after that to uh, to try and uh, and get to nine again. Um, oh, yeah. And he, uh, <laughs> and he would probably already be there if uh, Saudi Arabia hadn't been... Uh, uh, sorry, Singapore hadn't been uh, such a poor streak uh, yeah. with the fueling issue. But anyway, um, uh, no, I, I, I really... Would love to see somebody else take the fight to Red Bull on, on the Zandvoort circuit. And, and why not the McLarens who've been coming back strong? Why not a uh, revamped and, and, and energized uh, Mercedes? I don't know if Ferrari has taken the advantage of the summer break to get a little bit of their act together. I, I think the whole vibe of the whole season would change if we get the different winners. You know? Yeah. There's a lot of negativity about you know Red Bull winning as much as they do. So let's yeah. say, let's say Max wins this one, and then the next one, and then well, for three or four races we'll have a, a different team winning. Yeah, <laughs> you know we'll have a Mercedes Hamilton win that, that would make all uh, Team LH happy. You know that, <laughs> it, it'll change from being the worst season ever to uh, one of the best seasons ever. You never and, know. And then a new winner like Lando Norris, that would be nice. Maybe another yeah. rookie winner, Oscar Piastri. Who knows? He's he's doing he's doing really well. So yeah, in terms of legends, I think uh, it's it's always hard to look at uh, if Max would achieve the three time winners, then he, he he does get alongside Jackie Stewart and Nicky Lauda, um, and and that would be legendary. I think winning your home race three times in a row makes you already quite uh, legendary yeah. if you were to achieve that. Uh, it's like uh, Hamilton with the British Grand Prix. It always seems to do exactly what Menzel, Menzel said, I think, uh, that the home crowd gives you half a second advantage or something yeah, like and that. And Max doesn't believe in that. <laughs> I don't think so either, but he doesn't seem to feel the pressure either. He does, no. no, but he, he blocks it all off. I, yeah. think, I think Red Bull actually sort of gives him uh, less uh, PR work to do in Zandvoort because it's so crazy already. Yeah. I, I think so, and, and, and I hope so, because uh, yeah, it's, it's also a very tight circuit, so if you have to move around a lot, you, you lose a lot of time. It's very hectic. So uh, yeah. They did very well in the first year to put Jackie Stewart up front, and David Coulthard was there quite a lot uh, to, to comment on things for Red Bull. Uh, they don't have Danny Rick in the second Red Bull marketing no. role anymore. No. <laughs> he would have done great, but yeah, they decided to get rid of Nick just before his home Grand Prix. I've been reading that he might be a reserve driver. Yeah, for Mexico or something. Uh, because of uh, the fact that it interferes with Liam Lawson's uh, uh, calendar, racing yeah. calendar. Yeah. Uh, let's see about that. I, I mean, it, it seems tough to ask Nick to get back in a car as a test driver now. Yeah. But, well, we'll, I, we'll, we'll see about that. I think they're still paying him, you know, the the fee for a whole year so. I, I hope so. <laughs> you know, like I have my own business. If if I had somebody employed and I had to work, then I'll just uh, call them up again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I can imagine. So maybe, who knows, who knows? I don't know if he's doing any simulator work or if he's been back in touch with the team or if they said, well, take, uh, take two months off and we'll see you after that. I have no idea. It's been really quiet, he, except for uh, Jack's racing day, which he, uh, of course, uh, did the demo run with, uh, with the car. I, I haven't heard much about him. No. So, so that's who, the legends part. Yes. Well, uh, now it's time for your um, the final, the future of Zandvoort. The future of Zandvoort, the future of the Dutch Grand Prix. Um, Twenty-four, twenty-five were the options that uh, that they were given immediately at the moment of signing. It was a three-year deal plus two optional. And it was up to the Dutch Grand Prix to to take that option. I think they did that quite confidently. 
after seeing uh, how quickly it sold out and how well the first two editions went. But I think after that, it's going to be uh, rather difficult, actually, to uh, to keep Zandvoort in a fixed place in the calendar. And uh, I want to tell people why I think it's going to be very difficult, but also why I think it, it deserves a place on the calendar, at least, uh, even if it's not a fixed place. Uh, I think what the, the Dutch Grand Prix has done is, is actually quite interesting. They took all the, let's say, the, the drawbacks of the Zandvoort circuit. It's a small circuit in a close to the beach, it's completely boxed in, it doesn't have the capacity to get huge crowds in or out uh, very easily. Um, a lot of problems throughout this history with getting the, the correct uh, uh, permissions to actually drive Formula One cars or have enough races uh, there with sound, with environmental issues. Uh, uh, of course, it's in the beautiful dunes, but that also something that a lot of people want to protect. What they've done is created the most sustainable uh, uh, Formula One Grand Prix that is on the calendar currently with, uh, I think, something like 95% of the people going by public transport or bike. Uh, a lot of recycling uh, on the track um, with the, how they deal the, with, with the, the glasses, the bottles. Uh, it's the cleanest track uh, you'll, you'll see, I think, on the calendar. Um, especially a lot cleaner than, than Spa or Silverstone or Hungary, uh, as I have seen them. Uh, so they, and, and they've created this festival-like atmosphere where people stay a lot in the grandstands to party instead of move around a lot, because you can't really move around a lot. It quickly becomes one big traffic jam. So, yeah, keep them entertained, keep them in the grandstands and, and uh, make sure they, they get in early and that they, uh, they get out late. Uh, which also means that you see already on the Friday, uh, Super Friday, a packed grandstand. I made a point of this earlier in the year. I see a lot of venues saying we're completely sold out. And then I'm looking at the Friday and I see empty grandstands. I'm looking at the Saturday, Formula 2 races, sprint race, empty grandstand. Uh, maybe the grandstand is full by the time we get to Formula 1 on a Sunday or, or the qualifying sessions. Um, but Zandvoort is packed. It's back three days in a row. It's one big festival. And they're doing that really well. But next year, this year, we don't have Formula 3. Next year, we don't have Formula 2. Uh, so the offering is, uh, is, is, is a little bit in decline. I don't know what they're going to do to fill that up. I think the F1 Academy is going to drive at the same time as, the, um, as Formula 1, which I think is also a good development because why not give that more exposure? Yeah. But, but yeah, maybe the, the, the Zandvoort is going to have a problem offering enough of a show uh, for people to visit again for three days uh, for the fourth or fifth year in a row. Uh, the increasing trouble, of course, with, uh, with action groups, uh, the Extinction Rebellions or, or, or whatever you have, but also ongoing problems every year, every time again, with getting the permissions, with getting the permissions challenged by action groups. I think they've had every year now 35 or 40 lawsuits that they had to contend with. Uh, there being, um, uh, let's say that the municipality is not treating them very fairly in adding a ad additional charge, which is an entertainment charge only appropriate for the Formula One event to cover some expenses the municipality says that it's making while completely discounting all the revenues that it's generating yeah. thanks to the, the track. And, and uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it, it's not easy hosting this kind of event in the Netherlands. And I think it will not get a lot easier in the future. Um, if we have a extra team that is going to be joining Formula One, and there's a lot of push for that. Um, I don't know where you would put them in the pit lane. Yeah. Uh, we, we said earlier in the podcast, big cars, bulky cars, large, large cars. Last year, um, you saw what happened with Sainz. Uh, couldn't get out of his pit box almost. Uh, if somebody leaves a wheel gun trailing, then you drive over it. Uh, there's already so little room. And especially when you have a safety car and all the cars come in at the same time, uh, you can really see that the pit lane is one of the limitations of the track. And an 11th team, I don't know how you would fit it in there. No. So uh, that, that's going to be kind of tough. Um, so I think it's, it's, yeah, as a proposition, it's going to be tough moving forward, keeping it for 26 onward, 
on the calendar. And, and that's where I said uh, it deserves a place, but maybe not fixed. I think the plans are going to be to alternate it with the uh, Spa Grand Prix, yeah. yeah, with Belgium, which makes sense in the sense of we're serving the same market. Why do we compete all the time? They managed to separate that a bit by getting Spa uh, f- prior to the summer break instead of being the first race after the summer break. Uh, spa in summer is already a term you can use quite loosely. <laughs> it's <laughs> always been over there. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, I think they're, they're going to be, uh, uh, alternating on the calendar, uh, after 26. And, and for me, that, that kind of makes sense. I kind of find that logical. I, I think that, you know, when, uh, when Formula One was coming to, to the Netherlands, uh, everybody was really hyped up. Um, even, um, you know, the, 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 the municipality, uh, of, uh, Zandvoort. Yeah. was uh, hyped up about it and but now they've had it for two years and uh, this is the third year coming you know the the whole new vibe that's gone now and they only see the problems now um yeah. and um oh, yeah. i think if if zandford is looking quite honestly at uh, what the, the event is bringing uh you see property values going up enormously you see a lot of people have maybe the first edition uh, was was a lot of Dutchies. Uh, you see people from abroad saying, hey, we need to be at that party. So maybe a more international crowd, a more mixed crowd. Uh, that should bring in more people, uh, not just for the event, but also to the Amsterdam region uh, in general for a longer period mm-hmm. of time. So I think the, the, the economic effect is, 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 is very positive. It's the ecological effect that, uh, that gets a lot of uh, hype and attention, of course. Um, and I keep saying, I mean, yeah, it's one event. It's, it's broadcast the world over. If per audience member, per viewer, you calculate uh, what it costs in terms of uh, uh, carbon impact uh, to, uh, to run these cars, uh, I will compete with having stadiums filled with soccer fans uh, yeah. and all the police that has to surround that every weekend. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and, and, and we're doing our best to keep it as carbon neutral as possible or get there by 2030. Well, this is something I don't understand from, um, uh, you know, the, the, everybody is focused on uh, motorsport and uh, it being unhealthy or, you know, um, bad for yeah. the environment. But worldwide, there's uh, I don't know how many millions of pools that needed to be um, heated for people, uh, for people's entertainment. Yeah. And uh, I can go on and on. Everybody that does rec- recreational sports is uh, having a footprint on uh, on the environment. And then yeah. and then all the focus is on those those twenty cars for twenty four races in the season. Yeah, and Where, I still think whereas both, uh, all yeah. over Britain, there's there's uh, stock car races, you know, people with uh, with old shitty cars banging into each other all the time, <laughs> and there's no focus on that at all, you know. Yeah, and and you don't want to go and point a finger at it and say, okay, well, but, but what about them? Huh? I mean, that's never. I think it's a strong point for Formula One to say, okay, we'll take it in and we'll try to see how we can make the fuels more sustainable. How can we electrify more? How can we like Haas with their small pit box, eh? save money and save transport costs yeah. by making our pit wall one third of the size of other pit walls. I think this is maybe a smart solution. Um, but you have to realize at one point that you're, yeah, uh, the, the, most of the impact now, I think, will be coming from people going to the track. Uh, and yeah. you have whatever on any Grand Prix weekend, three to 400,000 people going to a track. Uh, and you need to make that more sustainable. I think that's Zandvoort is, is really an example of, of uh, a place that's doing that really well. I don't know if, you, if you've seen my uh, Coldplay video. Your Coldplay? No, I haven't. I, I, I made a video called uh, What F1 Can Learn From Coldplay. Okay. I went to see them in the Amsterdam Arena. Yeah. And um, they support about 15 um, uh, you know, environmental causes. That's why the tickets were so expensive. Okay. Yeah. Because thirty-five percent is uh, is brought to them, and then uh, it brought attention to uh, the ocean cleanup, to uh, plant a tree, uh, all kinds yeah. of, uh, of of wonderful environmental um, um, charities. <clears throat> mm. Then uh, they had these uh, dance floors 
which were um, I don't know dynamic dance floors and these people yeah, were yeah, jumping they, they on generate, it. Yeah, they generate energy. Yeah. yeah, and it generated energy which was stored in a battery for the next um, event. And what else nice. did they do? Oh, they were psych. There, there were bicycles that were generating energy, and I thought, mm. you know, this is costing like forty-five percent of what a normal concert of that size would cost. Mm -hmm. They're not preventing us from enjoying ourselves, and they're doing something for the environment. And this yeah. is where these these groups are doing it all wrong. These these stop oil now or whatever. <clears throat> they're trying to prevent people from enjoying themselves. Yeah, and that has exactly the opposite effect of what they're trying to trying to reach. Yeah. The thing is, and, and that's what I really admired in, in how we got Zandvoort done in the first place, is that you always think within the constraints that are put upon you, how do I make it better? How do I move forward? How do I uh, get it done? Instead of thinking uh, negatively or, or thinking that it won't be able, you won't be able to have your cake and eat it too, huh? in this case, to say, okay, we can have a great motor sporting event and make it sustainable. And it's a difficult positioning to say we're going to be the most sustainable Formula One Grand Prix uh, in the world. But it's one that actually uh, they can uh, claim realistically and that they've done a lot to, to achieve. Uh, so I think that that deserves a lot of credit and, and just for that also and for the fact that, uh, um, like Dominicalo also said, he said the, uh, the, the Dutch really opened our eyes for what a fan experience could be. Yeah, uh, at a track, and he said, I says it inspired them for for Vegas quite a lot. Uh, liberty to to see how they Total can. Total Wolf said something along those lines as well. He said, "The Sanford Grand Prix is the new benchmark for fan experience." Yeah, now and, and if you have, uh, do you uh, like my Total uh, voice? I like your Total voice. <laughs> I, I completely. I, I thought it, I was talking to him. Uh, <laughs> I. Uh, I totally believe that that you need to have a couple of those on the calendar, not too many. <laughs> I really like the old Silverstone experience as well, where you were just meeting a lot of people who generally work in the factories or are crazy about the sport since they were kids and, and, and talk to you about the old days. And, and that's something that I sometimes miss when you go to these festival uh, atmospheres. But I think it, it, it yeah, it did so much to innovate within the constraints that Zandvoort has to uh, has to deal with, that uh, it deserves a place on the calendar for. Well, I see sometimes now contracts announced until 2035 or 2040 something uh, with uh, countries that uh, have a lot less excitement and experience than uh, than Zandvoort has. So I hope they will get an alternating contract with Spa for yeah. another 10 years to come. Yeah, it would be terrible to lose it, but then again, yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, if it can go to a country that can easily afford everything that comes with uh, organizing a, a, yeah. a Formula One race. And if you go to a country where there's miles and miles of space around the track because there's yeah. fuck all to do around it, uh, yeah. it's much easier for the organization. You know, yeah. that's why you probably it have all these um, it uh, is. Yeah. Uh, uh, Arabian, uh, Saudi Arabian uh it's very easy races. to deal with with it's very easy to deal with one guy who has all the money and who can say how many billion here you go uh, and that and that's not the dutch way i mean i, I think if people really look at uh, I mean, we talked about jan lammers's job and what he has to do uh, to manage stakeholders i think the circuit director uh, robert uh, has a lot of work to do as, as well in that regard I think if people knew how many meetings uh, with com uh, committees uh, they had to go through to get this organized, um, yeah, I can imagine Saudi Arabia is easier. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but even the more so, I think if you unless can, unless uh, like there, this, there's yeah. rocket attacks in the in the neighborhood, that, yeah, that was a bit tricky. And and you have to talk about the drivers about not putting on uh, rainbow colored helmets <laughs> yes. and. Uh, no, I, I hope they go less to shitty countries like that. But yeah, uh, yeah that's my opinion. I, I see the sports that. washing going on uh, in, in, in other sports as well. And it's uh, it's quite horrible. So I hope we can uh, we can cherish the position that uh, yeah. the Dutch have gained over the past years. <laughs> okay, well, predictions. Uh, the top three for 
the qualifying and the race and uh something weird that's gonna happen that's what i know that's what i want to know from you Ooh. uh qualifying um let me go out on I'm a gonna limb write and, it down. Say, and say max is not going to qualify on pole this time uh and let's say that lando is going to qualify on pole that's nice max is going to be second and leclerc is going to be third Okay. Got, I've got Max, Leclerc, and uh, Hamilton. Okay. That's quali. Okay, and then the race? For the race, I do think actually Red Bull for the race will have the strongest car. Yes. We'll deal with the DAG a lot better, so I do think Max will win. By the way, why don't I mention Perez? Because the past two editions, he hasn't performed very well in Zandvoort. No. Uh, fifth, sixth, and, uh, and even further back, so he's out of my calculations. Uh, so it's Max for me for the win, and let's say I see Lando and Hamilton. Okay. I see Lando holding on to P2 and Hamilton uh, on the podium. Okay. And I've got Perez, P2, because... Wow, you do think he's going to do a lot better. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Hamilton, P3. Okay. Okay, and then... Uh, is there anything special going to happen? Uh, Alonso and O'Connor are going to uh, get entangled and <gasps> oh, cause a that crash. Would, that, that would give such a vibe. Those two again, you know... <laughs> They don't even mention each other's names anymore. Did, did no. you see that F1? Um, uh, they did a, a thing like uh, call the winners by alphabet. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, um, yeah, race winners by alphabet. Yeah, yeah and, so and I... then it, then with Alonso, they came to the O, and he goes, "He was your teammate." Pass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's uh, there's quite a lot of bad blood there. Al Alonso is going into dark mode when he uh, <laughs> when he sees Ocon. So for me, that's uh, yeah, they're, they're not gonna. Uh, let's say I think they're going into the Hugo holes together, and uh, they won't come out. <laughs> um. Okay, well, you've got a big uh, class. And see, I haven't prepared this, so I have to make something up on the spot. <laughs> but you prepared the question, but not your answer. <laughs> yeah, um, I think... I think... Nobody's going to throw flares this year. That would be a strange thing. Yeah, there, there's going to be flares. There's going to be flares. No, um, I think um, there's going to be... Uh, um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of something original. Well, stranger than fiction. Yeah. Um, a driver is going to fall ill and Nick Ferrari be called upon to replace Ferrari him. Ferrari is going to have a brilliant strategy. Yeah. That's a, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. <laughs> you know, Leclerc... Do, do you remember the first edition that Raikkonen actually got COVID and that uh, he was replaced by... Uh... Don't remember that? We yeah. had Kubica racing in the first edition because Raikkonen got COVID. I I can't remember that. No. Oh. Wow. Yeah. I was I was too focused on uh, on the championship battle in 2021. Yeah. Um, so 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 ima imagine the surprise if if a driver falls ill and Nick de Vries gets to replace them at the Dutch Grand Prix. That that would be <laughs> that would be amazing too. Yeah 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 yeah. I so hope hoped for him to to be able to drive that home Grand Prix. I mean, if yeah. there's one thing he would have wanted and expected and dreamed of even more than driving in Vegas is uh, it's, it's driving in front of a crazy home crowd. But, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, we're going to have an entertaining, um, uh, you know, national anthem this time. I didn't like it that much last year, the the sort of the rock the, the ballad. The rock version, yeah. Yeah. The and year, before, have Andre the year before was really good. And now we have Andre Rio. Um, playbacking on his uh, violin. Yeah, I, was, I, I don't think they're going to bring out the entire orchestra <laughs> on the grid, right? No, no. <laughs> no he's just going to stand there with his violin. Na, na, yeah. na, na. I yeah. have to say, when they announced the entertainment lineup for the Dutch Grand Prix, 
I thought, okay, I must not forget my earplugs. Okay, so who's, I don't even know who's, uh, who's playing there. <sighs> Tino Martin. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mental Theo is there, of course, every time. Okay, well, a little, little bit of 90s. Uh, uh, yeah. And so, so we have these kinds of all white, middle aged, um, yeah, pretty mainstream. Not, not, not a Martin Garrix, not a Hardwell, not a Tiesto, not a. Not, not, none of the Armin van Buren are really good export products. No. no. So uh, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm really wondering what that's going to be like, the entertainment. But uh, yeah. And André Rieu for the national anthem. Okay, well, we'll, yeah. we'll probably hear it twice. <laughs> I have my earplugs. <laughs> hey, uh, Rob, thank you very much for, um, for doing yeah. this podcast with us. And uh, I hope it gets a lot of views. And, um, you know, who knows? But we might do this again in the future because... You're always a very nice. good guest uh, to have. So thanks so very much. It was much. a nice chat. So thank you very much. And I really enjoyed uh, diving into the history again of uh, Zandvoort. And, uh, and I hope a bright future. Okay. Take care now. Okay. Doei doei. Thanks. Bye.